nice introduction. Um, I, I do have to make a few comments, though, about what's just been said and what's been shown. First of all, as you can see, my hair got grayer and grayer as the pictures went on, so I, I'm getting much older now. But the real interesting story is the very first picture. The very first picture that was shown when I first came here, uh, Admiral Kayan asked me to come to uh, speak to Helmepa, and Mitsatsos uh, felt I was too young, and he needed a military person. So I couldn't come by myself. I had to come with Tom Robinson, who was a captain in the Coast Guard. And only then would he accept me into uh, Greece and with Helmepa. So, okay, now I can come by myself. So I guess he's happy with me now. So thank you very much, okay? <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to come to speak to you. Um, what I've tried to do is put together a little presentation that talks about the latest issues uh, that are affecting the shipping industry. And I want to make, manage your expectations now. Uh, number one, let's face it, the number one issue for the shipping industry is the market. Okay? But I can't do anything about the market. That's something you have to do your, yourself in dealing with that. And then number two, certainly from the tanker side, is the vetting, making sure that the charterers uh, accept what you're doing and you can they accept your tankers. I don't speak to that. What I focus on are the regulatory issues. And these are the subjects that I would like to uh, address today, if that's okay with you. I'm going to cover the various issues here as we, as we go through it, give you an update on each of these. Uh, I, I should also add, by the way, that uh, I do a lot of traveling involved with the shipping industry for the past 40 years, more than 40 years, and have uh, traveled all over the world, of course. The place I go to most is London. I am always there, other things like that. But Athens is where I come second most, and it's Athens that I enjoy the most. Why? Is it the weather? Well, yeah, it's something to do with it, the history. But honestly, I'm not, I'm telling you the truth, it's the interaction that I've had with the ship owners, both when I was with the Coast Guard and when I was now with Intertanko. Uh, you're you're thought-provoking, you're challenging, and that stimulates me, and I think we have good dialogue on these issues. And I hope we can do something very similar, give me your opinions, and we can talk about some of these things. And finally, before I go to the presentation, one last comment. I need your advice. I need your opinions. When I walk into the voting booth on November 8th, I don't know who to vote for. So anybody has an advice for me on who I should vote for, please let me know, okay? <laughs> okay, let me turn to the presentation then, okay? I start with ballast water and we'll move through. What I suggest, if you would like, after I finish each one, or even during, if you have any questions, by all means, an open discussion so we can discuss the issues as we go through. So first on ballast water, I'd like to address it within this context. I apologize, but I can't see, I don't have all the slides memorized, I'll have to turn a little bit. We'll talk about IMO, and then we'll talk about the U.S. issues. Talking about IMO first, well, we all know we have a treaty that now is going to enter into force on September 8th uh, next year. There's this view that Finland had the tonnage to bring it over. The reality is, before Finland ratified, there was enough tonnage. <laughs> but with, with the Finnish ratification, it made it official, so it will happen. Why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? Under the heading of full disclosure, whenever I talk about ballast water, I have to tell you, I was the head of the U.S. delegation that negotiated the ballast water treaty. And so I guess the reason it took so long is I was part of the problem in coming up with a treaty that was prescriptive. And by that I mean imposing requirements that could not be met in 2004, but thought they could be met in the near future. And that turned out not to be the case. So, these are the parties. I just give you an idea of with the treaty entering into force uh, next year. You see on the left the countries that currently are the parties, not all of them, of course, and the same on the right, the major countries that are not the parties. So, you take that into account in your shipping, it may have an impact on where your ship goes. I would guess, though, that now that the treaty is going to enter into force, you're going to see more of these countries on the right now signing up. In fact, Panama, we think, is going to be becoming a part of this treaty uh, in the very near future, and maybe a few others. With regard to Greece, I defer to the uh, Greek Coast Guard on that one. You can decide on that one. So, the major issues. There were three major issues. The first is that the actual ballast water standard, referred to as the GA standard, was not robust enough. At the time it was adopted, 
in 2004, it was felt it was uh, pushing technology. Turns out it's not even robust enough now. So that needed to be, it would not produce reliable equipment. Number two, the schedule that was set up in the treaty was not realistic. If the treaty entered into force immediately, it was going to be realistic and give ship owners an opportunity to phase in the installation. But after about five years, that went out the window. So it was not realistic. And finally, the port state control. The certain administrations were looking to impose port state control procedures that were more rigorous than the actual approval standards for the equipment. So something needed to be done about this. And on a positive note, many of you probably know about this, uh, things were done. First, on the port state control. Good news for the ship owner, in our opinion. Agreement that there would be a trial period for three years after it enters into force. So from September 8, 2017 to September 8, 2020, will be part of that trial period, where during that period, there will be sampling and testing, but no penalty action will be taken against the ship that is felt to be in non-compliance. Um, of course, the U.S. is not part of this treaty. They did reserve their position on this, so we're going to have to deal specifically with the U.S., and we'll talk about that in a second. The other thing that was done, which was very good, is they developed guidelines for port state control, which are now more in line with the existing treaty, like MARPOL and SOLAS. You start out with a basic general inspection, look at the certificates, check the ship. If that's okay, you need to go no further. Same way it's done with MARPOL and with SOLAS. Then, if for some reason the documents are not in order, or if there's something that the ship owner or the inspector feels, maybe the crew doesn't know what they're talking about, then you go to the next level and continue on down. It's a, a cascading effect, but this is at least the same way it is in the other treaties. So this is all, in our opinion, good for the ship owner. By the way, I'm leaving the presentation with Helmepa, so they will have this to pass around to whoever of the members that would like it. Okay, so I see some people are copying notes. I just make you aware of that. Turning to the schedule, it was recognized that the schedule was not realistic, so back in 2013, more good news for the ship owner. The IMO Assembly adopted a resolution to provide a schedule that was much more realistic, tying it to the IOPP certificate, Annex 1 IOPP certificate, and you would have to then install the equipment by the renewal of your IOPP after the convention enters into force. So, enters into force next September. Renewal certificates after that date would then be when the, IO, the ballast water system would need to be installed upon your ship to comply with the IMO requirements. Um, there is, we're in the process right now of developing text to take what's in that resolution and make it actually part of the treaty. But there's also, I would say, some more good news, we hope. There are currently two proposals on the table one by Liberia and one by a number of shipping associations, including Intertanko, ICS, and others, to modify those dates. ICS is, I'm sorry, uh, Liberia is very straightforward. They're basically saying to amend the resolution and hence the text that would go into the treaty to make it the second renewal survey after entry into force. And what the industry has proposed is something similar, which I'll tell you about in a few more minutes. Uh, but it's linked to the actual approval of the new G8 uh, requirements. So this is something that's going to be discussed uh, at the end of October at MEPC 70. And if this goes through, this allows for more time for the ship owner to install this equipment. With regard to type approvals, uh, we currently have 65 systems that are approved under IMO. In my opinion, I'm not sure too many of them, if any, are going to be really very reliable on your ship. There may be some people in the audience who produce this equipment who have different opinions. Everybody's entitled to their opinion on this. Um, what the industry has done is recommended that there be a comprehensive review and rewrite of these G8 guidelines. The IMO has agreed to do that. They're in the process of doing that. We identified, I think it was six issues, but it's now expanded to 34 and it's taking more time than everybody thought. The objective, though, is to have this done and completed at the IMO meeting that takes place in October. So another thing that we look to have happen in October. Part of that also is a roadmap for what is called uh, early movers. In going forward with a revision to the G8, we need to make sure that those that were proactive, that installed an existing piece of equipment, 
that met the G8, current G8, would not be penalized. And so there is a roadmap for early movers. And it, something like this, which is, is in good shape, I think. It, it allows the ship owner would not be required to uh, replace it once the new guidelines are adopted. They would not be required to replace it once it's installed, maintained, and operated properly, which is also good. And early movers should not be penalized if, in fact, there's an occasional exceedance. Unfortunately, after those three items, there's a little footnote at the bottom of this roadmap that does say you know, the, the port states could impose penalization if they think it's appropriate or more information becomes available. So that's something that's still there. We have to see how that exists. But the big issue with the roadmap right now and how it's going to impact the ship owner is this. Well, once there are G8 requirements, when does the application of these new G8 requirements apply? Does it apply when they're adopted, which could be next month? Certainly not realistic if that's the case. Does it apply a certain period after that, or once there's enough systems out there? This is something that has to be discussed next week. And on this issue, what the Indian shipping industry associations, including Intertanko, have done is submitted a proposal on how this should be done. And this is linked now to that implementation schedule. And we're providing the committee some options. We're saying, hey, we'll let you choose which way you wish to do it, but we think we have sound basis upon which you should proceed on this. We propose either make it the first renewal survey after the IMO makes a specific determination that there are adequate numbers of G8 equipment out there for the ship owners to install. Or if the member states don't like that, then we say allow those whose compliance date occurs within two years or some other number they wish to pick after entry into force to adjust it to the second renewal. So it's not too different from what Liberia is suggesting. So my point now on IMO is that a lot of good things have happened so far for the ship owner. The MEPC meeting that meets at the end of October hopefully is going to resolve these outstanding issues. They will finalize the G8 so we know what the new equipment standards would be. They will then finalize any implementation schedule, hopefully allowing ship owners more time, and they will finalize this roadmap. All of those will be decided at this meeting, and when that's done, we can report that back to you. Any questions or comments on IMO before I move to the U.S.? No? Okay. What do you expect the reaction of the IMO members, especially especially the uh, more green ones or North European ones, would be to these yeah. two proposals? They're not going to support it. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't think they're going to support it. And I say that because a similar version of what Liberia proposed to this meeting, as you know, was proposed at the last meeting. And it was basically rejected. But they allowed, they said, Liberia, if you want to come back again, go ahead and try it. So Liberia is doing that. The difference between what Liberia has done and what we have done is not, Liberia has based it on their recommendation based on availability of equipment and shipyard uh, availability, which is, which is all valid, by the way. What we've based our arguments on in our paper is more sets the environment, saying to the member states, look, why force the shipping industry to put a piece of equipment on board that may not succeed what you want in protecting the environment, buy a little more time, and then you get the ship owners to put on a solid, robust piece of equipment that actually does protect the environment. That's the different approach, which we think might be more successful, but the countries you just identified, I think, will still have opposition. So we'll see what happens. Okay? Let me turn to the U.S. now. Sorry, another question? Okay. The U.S. Well, we know that the Coast Guard issued regulations back in, what, 2012. The first thing I would say, as I say at every meeting, is Intertanko and every other shipping association does not support or endorse unilateral action by any country. We think that the U.S. should have just followed what IMO was doing, but they chose not to. They've issued their regulations. Now, on a positive note, they did do some good things. They did use the same IMO discharge standard. They did 
uh, initially come up with a schedule that was similar to what IMO had, but now with that resolution I mentioned, which may be further changed by the meeting next month, the Coast Guard is very, very clear. They will not change their implementation schedule. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Okay, so hang on on that one. Um, if you don't discharge in U.S. waters, 12 miles, you don't have to put a piece of equipment on board. And they also allowed ships to install an alternative management system. So you could install an AMS that would be accepted for five years, and now they're allowing that to be extended even further. So they tried to be what I would call reasonable in dealing with this. Um, they also recognized that the regulations require a Coast Guard approved system, but there are no Coast Guard approved systems. There still are none right now. So they allowed the ship owner to apply for extensions. So when you look at the Coast Guard impact on the, the shipping industry, there's basically two issues. When do you have to install it? And that's related to the extensions. And what type of equipment do you put on board? Because it's got to be a Coast Guard approved equipment. So I'd like to focus on those two issues to help you understand what's going on there. Let me start first with the extensions. When the extensions first started coming in, the Coast Guard was very um, stingy with granting the extensions. Those requested in 2014, whose dry docking was 14, they gave them until January 1st of 16, and then 15 to January 1st, 17. As you see, it's there. Um, Intertanko, I mean, they asked me to go to the Coast Guard and say, come on, give us a break. Why, why do you link it to January? Let's move it to the next, to the next uh, shipyard availability. Um, and they, they have done that, which you'll see in a second. But right now, where we stand, the information I got from the Coast Guard last week, they have issued more than 9,600 extension letters. So in effect, if you request an extension, they will give it to you. So if you have not requested an extension from the Coast Guard yet, I strongly recommend you do that, because they will give it to you. They're being very reasonable about this. They have come out with some policy letters on this. This first one was a result of us engaging with them. They did move the extension dates from January 1st of each year to the uh, next scheduled dry docking, which we think was a good way to go, and they've gone. There were some other minor details they came up with, but the other point I want to make is the bottom one. As you approach your extension, if there are no Coast Guard approved systems, they will not automatically give you a supplemental. You have to apply again for the supplemental. They will give it to you but you have to apply for it. We, we talked to them and said, look, this is a pet work exercise. Why bother? The lawyers of the Coast Guard said, look, the regulations are in the law is very specific about how this is to be done, so we have to follow that. So that's a minor point. Submitting the extension and the supplemental can be handled very simply. They also just came out with a new policy, a revised policy, improved policy in July of this year. And what that was... That's related to those people that have already installed the AMS systems. The AMS, when they originally put the regulations out, said you have five years from when you install it. Now they're giving you five years from the extension that you may get for installing the new equipment. So there's more time for putting that piece of equipment on board. And the last paragraph, you can read it when you get the presentation. That's a minor detail for those that may have you know, in a, a, a timing issue. That's not uh, too significant there. So my point on extensions is, go for it. They will give it to you, and it's worth having, as you'll see as we get toward the end. Now, let's turn to ballast water approvals for the Coast Guard. Um, there are 38 manufacturers who have gone to the Coast Guard and said they submitted a letter of intent. We intend to uh, uh, seek Coast Guard approval. There are 58 AMS manufacturers. So my first comment is, if you're going to put a system on board your ship, I strongly recommend you do one of those 38. Because if you pick one of the other 20, they're not seeking Coast Guard approval. And that system will have to be replaced for sure. Keep that in mind. There are at least, Coast Guard says, 19 systems that are in various stages of approval. And in fact, recently the Coast Guard has come out and said three have completed the actual testing. And I'm not going to mention names, but one company put out a press release on Monday saying that they have completed their testing and they have submitted the paper. I checked with the Coast Guard this morning. They said they have not received the application yet, but they expect to receive it by the end of this week. So the first actual application 
is in, supposedly going to be submitted um, later this week. And just to understand the process, only after the testing is all done does the manufacturer then review the results and then actually go to the Coast Guard and seek approval. So that's the process that has followed. Hopefully, a number of manufacturers are going to, in addition to this one I mentioned, are going to be submitting their applications later this year. Coast Guard has indicated to me that they're looking for a 30-day turnaround time. They want to move quickly. They want to get approvals out there. They've also indicated, though, that they have to look at these applications to make sure there's certain issues are addressed. Scaling up of testing and things like that are things they're going to be looking at. So they're not going to be rubber stamping the testing. They're going to be doing looking at it. They hope to have them done in 30 days. It may take a little longer. We'll see what happens. But they say by the end of this year they should have some. Now, those of you who may be aware or have UV systems or sought approval uh, to use a UV system on your ship, you maybe probably know this already, but four manufacturers, four UV manufacturers, went to the Coast Guard, not seeking approval of their equipment, but seeking acceptance of equivalency method for acceptance of their equipment. And that was based on using viable organisms versus the actual uh, uh, method that the Coast Guard uses, which is dead and live. The uh, test approach they used was the most probable number. As I'm sure you know by now, the Coast Guard denied their request in December. They appealed that request, and the Coast Guard in July took final agency action and denied that appeal. That does not mean a UV system will not be accepted by the Coast Guard. It simply means that that alternative method would not be accepted, and these systems can still do other things. And in fact, these force manufacturers I'm aware of are now going through testing in what they consider to be in accordance with the Coast Guard methodology so that they can get approval. We'll see how that works out. So I'm not saying don't continue your pursuit of UV, just be aware of what's going on in UV systems. Now, where do we stand when we're going to have Coast Guard approval? Well, they say sometime by the end of this year is when they're going to have it. Uh, they say that once they have Coast Guard approved systems, they will come up with a practical approach to require them to be installed on the ships. And once they have approval systems, they're going to let you know right away. They're not going to wait for a batch of them to come out. Um, and I say that because what, I, what Intertanko asked me to raise with them is the concept of a monopoly. It, the first one that's approved would have a monopoly on all the other systems. And uh, to make a long story short, they said, Joe, that's not going to happen. What I give you here is what I call my best guess on how they're going to do it. And I can tell you this is more than a best guess. What I have here, although not officially confirmed, is pretty much what the Coast Guard is going to do. Each ship that comes to the U.S. is going to have a compliance date upon when you must install a U.S. Coast Guard approved system. That is going to be based upon either the actual Coast Guard regulations or, for more than 9,600 ships, their extension letter. So as your date approaches on your ship in that extension letter, you then have a choice. Install one of the Coast Guard approved systems that are out there, or go back to the Coast Guard and ask for a supplemental extension to that date. But in requesting that supplemental extension, you will have to justify to them why any of the Coast Guard approved systems that are out there cannot be put on your ship in conjunction with scheduling your dry dock. So that's how they're probably going to, I can't guarantee you, but that's how they're probably going to go about it. Okay? And that's pretty reasonable, in my opinion. And I was just reassured of that again this morning by the Admiral. I mentioned in one of the slides they, they, did, they did adopt the IMO standard, but they were required to do a practicality review. That is to see if they should be imposing a more rigorous standard. Good news here, the Coast Guard has done the practicality review. They completed it, uh, I think it was last year, and they concluded that the technology to do better than what they have right now doesn't exist right now. So that means the status quo, the technology that's out there, the, the requirements are not going to change for the time being. So that's, that's good both for the manufacturers and for the shipping industry. Let me turn now briefly to EPA under the Vessel General Permit. Uh, they issued that back in 2013. To a large extent, it basically follows what the Coast Guard has done. 
Um, the, uh, the, the two, if you want to say the differences are, they require monitoring um, to be re- is required on, on your ships. And you all know that. You're doing that right now anyway. It's nothing new. The big difference is the EPA said they will, they will not accept extensions. Why not? EPA VGP is based on what's called best available technology. The Coast Guard has 58 AMS systems. Therefore, as far as EPA is concerned, the technology exists right now. Of course, that puts the ship owner in a, in a problem. If you get an extension from the Coast Guard, what do you do about the EPA standard? Well, the two of them got together and they came out with an enforcement policy that basically, if you get an extension from the Coast Guard, then and you comply with the VGP in all other ways, they will then consider that non-compliance as a uh, low priority. And to this date, we're not aware of any ship owner that has any penalty action taken against them under this low priority enforcement. So they're, they're going forward with that. Of course, it does raise, in my opinion, certainly from the tanker standpoint and maybe other shipping, a chartering issue. When you sign a charter agreement with your charter party, uh, you have to agree that you're going to comply with all laws and regulations. So if you, you get the extension from the Coast Guard, you're in compliance. But if you discharge within three miles of U.S. waters, you would not be in compliance. How would that impact your charter party agreement? I've raised this with the charterers. They said at this point they're not looking at this right now. They're not concerned. But I feel I have an obligation to make sure everybody is aware of this as we go through. The other thing going on with EPA is that uh, they were taken to court saying that they should not have used the same ballast water standard that the Coast Guard and IMO used. The courts looked at this. I won't give you the whole story, but the short of it is the courts agreed with the people that went to court, and so the courts have remanded EPA to go back and review their standard. Not to change it, review it, okay? But they said the VGP that's in place stays in place until they do that. In my discussions with EPA on this, they've made two comments. First, they're not going to do it now. They're going to do it when they renew the VGP, which has been done in 2018. In 2017, they'll start the process of rewriting the new VGP. At that point, then, they'll discuss the standard, and the industry will have an opportunity to comment. But the other thing they've said to me unofficially is they were part of the Coast Guard team that did the practicality review that said the Coast Guard standard is acceptable and there's no other standard that at this point could meet a higher standard. So that kind of sends a signal that it's pretty unlikely, unless something changes drastically between now and 2018, that they would come up with a more onerous standard. No guarantee, but that's kind of where we stand there. And finally, on ballast water California, California had a standard much more rigorous. Uh, Just quickly, the good news is down at the bottom. EPA, the, the, uh, the Coast Guard, I'm sorry, California has decided to allow extensions of their enforcement policy until 2020, both for new and existing ships. The governor signed the bill. So for California, we don't have to worry for another four years. That's kind of behind us. That's ballast water. Any questions or comments on what's going on in the U.S.? Yes? Initial reaction, I'm going to be very frank, which I always am. The U.S. is not going to ratify the Ballast Water Treaty. The U.S. is going to regulate ballast water in the U.S. through these regulations and through their laws. So therefore, any comments or suggestions that you may may make, speaking as part of the consultative group, I assume, therefore, advocating what I am always going to be doing is going to fall on deaf ears. They'll be polite to you, don't get me wrong, but they're not going to change anything. 
So I just want to manage your expectations when you have that meeting next week. That's my honest opinion, okay? Yes, Stamatis. Some of you I know in the audience, so. <laughs> Is uh, trying to follow this very interesting presentation that they do, especially for this convention, and of course for the US regulation. Uh, if I understood well, you said that uh, the US Coast Guard considers, as we speak, uh, granting extensions for dry dockings scheduled in 2017 and 2018. Is it something correct which I understood? Or? Y yes. I can, I can say that we have members who have dry dockings due in 2017 and some of them in 2018 have requested extensions from the Coast Guard and they've been given those extensions. In fact, on the 2018, they've been given to 2023. Okay, very interesting because we also have asked for extensions but not yet for that uh, period. So we have to do it. I mean, my comment. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, given also the feedback that it gave us, that three uh, systems have completed uh, the testing, uh, do you believe that if these three are finally approved through the review of the files, is it going to be a condition that is not considered as monopolistic, and then maybe the Coast Guard decides that from now on uh, we have to go ahead with installation. Ah, good question because um, this was, I was asked of this recently, uh, very briefly. Admiral Thomas put out a blog, I think it was last week, about now that the convention is in force, here's what's going on in the Coast Guard. And in that blog, he made a statement that said, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like compliance uh, dates will uh, be, be uh, determined after there are Coast Guard approved equipment. Members started calling me up saying to me, Joe, this seems to me that once there's approved equipment, the Coast Guard is going to review all of these dates. So last night I sent an email to Admiral Thomas. He responded to me this morning. Every vessel that has the extension letter, what is in that extension letter will remain valid and will not be changed by the Coast Guard. I think that's what you're getting at, right? They will not come back and make anything retroactive. This is very, very important. Very yes. Important. But on another context, if these three systems, yeah. if I understood well, have completed their testing and now they will apply for approval, yeah. if they are approved, is it enough number for the Coast Guard to consider that now there is no any more uh, no. monopolistic uh, or there is yeah. no such a... No, that, yeah, that's not, I'm trying to explain, that's not the concept they're going to use. They are not looking at how many and then require ships to comply. They're going to do it, as I said, ship by ship basis. If you decide that you don't want to put one of those on that are approved, you apply for a supplemental extension. But in your supplemental extension, you will have to justify to them why one of those systems cannot be installed. They will look at it ship by ship basis. It will not be uh, a holistic approach of that many systems out there and dealing with it. Okay? okay yes, sir. For example, if it doesn't fit, would, it, would that suffice? What do you mean by doesn't fit? Meaning that maybe these uh, systems that are going to be approved uh, will require uh, large parking modifications that would actually not fit in the ships. Yeah. Uh, you would be given the opportunity to justify to the Coast Guard why those pieces of equipment would not be suitable for your ship. It could be based on capacity of the, of the system. It could be based on your next, when you can schedule to get one system, when you can dry dock it, and including those other items. Whether they will grant it or not, they will decide. Okay, so I can't give you a definitive answer, but they've indicated the ship owner should provide us their justification and we will review it. I would make this one comment, Stamatis, on what you just said. You asked about 2017, 2018. My strong advice is apply before they have any Coast Guard approved equipment. 
You follow me? Okay, keep that in mind. If you have not applied, apply now. <laughs> because once they have approved equipment, then you've got to justify why you can't put that one on board. Okay? Okay. Isn't it, yeah. Isn't it one year prior to the implementation? They, they are taking applications okay. anytime. So I, I, I had a member just now I was talking to. He sent me an email. He sent me an email, uh, I don't know, a month ago. Joe, what do I do? I said, send in a request for supplemental. He sent it in. Two weeks later, he got the extension. His dry dock was at the end of this year. Don't worry about that. Okay? However, I would, I would say this to, to provide the complete picture. If it's less than a year, at least give them a reason why you didn't do it within the year. You understand? We have already applied and have uh, answers back posted yeah. uh, within 10 days from the application. Just yeah. an answer. The gentleman who has not yet uh, received one, if they are too quick. Yeah. They're responding very quickly now. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on. What's the next subject? Let's see. Ah, greenhouse gases. I have an expert sitting right here in case anybody has any questions. <laughs> I, I make this very simple, but I want to make sure you're aware of what you will have to do. Okay, this is background. We know right now energy efficiency design index for all new ships, ship energy efficiency management plan for all ships. IMO has considered market-based measures, but has not really had much success. So where are they going now? They're moving now to what we call the three-step phase-in approach um, to see if they can come up with additional technical and operational measures for ships in operation. What is the three-step phase, three phase-in approach? Phase one, or step one, collect data. Collect data on fuel consumption, so we can actually have a, a, a baseline from which to operate from on deciding what should be done for operational efficiency of ships. Once the data is collected, move to the second phase, do an assessment of that data. See what it indicates, see what uh, shipping industry's contribution is to the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And then finally, once they do that assessment, make a decision on should there be regulatory requirements for shipping. What I want to make you aware of right now is that there is very uh, sufficiently uh, developments being made at IMO on the first phase, data collection. What has been agreed to at IMO at a meeting in April, the MEPC 69, is draft amendments to Annex 6 of MARPOL that would apply to all ships over 5,000 gross tons, and the data to be collected, as you see there, and the data to be verified by the administration or the recognized organization. This is the process that currently exists within the regulation that would impact you as a ship owner. At the end of each calendar year, the ship aggregates the data collected in that calendar year for your fuel consumption. Within three months of the end of the year, you must submit that data to your flag state. Then, and that data is going to be submitted electronically using a standardized format that IMO will develop. Then the data will be verified by the your flag state, and they will turn around then and taking guidelines developed by the organization, they'll submit that data to IMO. That's the process that's going to be used that's in the regulations right now. And then once the administration reports the data is registered, the ship is issued a certificate called an IMO Ship Fuel Consumption Database that your vessel has complied with this requirement. Now, this tells you what's going to happen from a process standpoint. We're talking, as I said, about amendments to, to Annex 6 of MARPOL. These amendments... I can almost tell you 99% confident it's going to be adopted at this meeting in October. When they're adopted in October, there's a 10-month period for circulation and then a six-month period for entry into force. So these amendments will enter into force most likely in March of 2018. And based on that, uh, They'll decide, but I'm pretty sure they're going to say, okay, we'll start the data collection at the end of 2018. It won't be a complete year, but they want the data to start being collected. That's still to be decided. But at least you should be aware 
IMO is going to maintain an anonymized database so they're not going to be able to identify what ship is, is submitting what data. This is going to be adopted, in my opinion, very confidently uh, in October. While this is going on, there's going to be a parallel effort going on. This parallel effort is, you could say, has been floundering along for a while. But at the last NEPC meeting, there were basically three submissions on this issue. Uh, the first one, led by Germany, but submitted by these other countries also, was that IMO should develop what's called a, a fair share uh, of reducing, shipping industry's fair share of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and they wanted to develop a timeline, is what they said. ICS submitted their own paper by themselves, specifically asking that IMO develop an intended IMO determined contribution. These other shipping associations necessarily did not agree with what ICS was doing. So we submitted a paper. Our paper didn't comment on the ICS paper. We focused more on commenting on the German paper saying, hey, we have no problem with the timeline, but let's make sure we operate under certain ground rules, certain principles, and move forward with this. I'm not going to bore you too much with the detail, but these are the principles that were advocated in our paper. Okay? But the most important one is that the policy should be based on actual fuel consumption of the fleet. Because what else do you have to base it on? Anything else is a guess. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this with you. Don't have to read it all, but I'll keep going. Now, wh what happened at that meeting? Well, what happened at that meeting was they really didn't reach an agreement. They said, we'll discuss this all at the next meeting. We're going to have a working group to discuss this. And... Uh, see where it goes. What, on a positive note, what did happen at this meeting is that just recently, Intertanko, BIMCO, ICS, Intercargo, and the World Shipping Council all got together and said, let's make sure we speak with one voice from the shipping industry and not go to this meeting like we did with different voices. So we negotiated a document that we've submitted to IMO to show that industry does want to move forward on this parallel, and we basically asked that they uh, develop a roadmap to determine a possible IMO contribution, including a timeline. Uh, the details of the roadmap, the details of the timeline to be sorted out, but at least showing that we, what we will attempt to move forward on this and uh, see how it, it develops. This will be discussed at the upcoming meeting in October. My expectation is what will happen. Probably not a whole lot. There will be an agreement. Yes, there should be a roadmap, probably. And there probably will be the agreement. Okay, let's go with the timeline. But that is to be developed at some future stage. The main point here was two things. To show the industry was speaking as one, and to show the industry was willing to move forward in a structured approach based on certain guiding principles. And hopefully that will help the member states in moving forward in a positive way on this. Before I move on to the EU, which is very brief, though, questions on what's going on at IMO on greenhouse gases? Okay. EU, I'll go through very quickly. I'm sure you're all aware of this. They've adopted their own, uh, they call it MRV system, applies to ships over 5,000. If you call in their ports, the data to be reported is fuel consumption, distance, time at sea, and actual cargo. I would speak to that for just a second. Um, the IMO, if you notice, did not require actual cargo. It talked about maximum dead weight. I would be open with you and tell you that Intertanko at that meeting proposed to IMO that actual cargo be included to be consistent with what the European Commission had done. The other industry segments were not in favor of this, and I could understand this, in particular the container industry or the cruise industry. How would they go about doing that? So it was not accepted by IMO. So it's now moving forward uh, with maximum dead weight. Earlier this morning, there was a meeting of the roundtable chairman discussing this issue. And the roundtable chairman, including it to Tanko, have all agreed we should concentrate our efforts now in going to the European Commission to convince them to make their requirements the same as IMO. We don't want to have the shipping industry have to meet two different set of requirements for data collection. So, the chairman have agreed that the roundtable members will now be trying to convince the EC to change their regulations. Well, hopefully we'll be successful. But we would certainly appreciate help from any of the ministers 
that are going to be there because it's the parliament, I understand, where the problem is occurring. And we need the countries to be supporting us on this. So we're trying to move forward in, this, in that direction. Very quickly, uh, on the dates for the EU, I'm sure you're well aware. But the bottom line is, you have to first start reporting in January of 2018, and then subsequently after that, each April after there, submit the information. And I'm sure you, you all know of this and are preparing for it already. The other thing the EU is working on is more details on validation and accreditation, and also monitoring and reporting. Um, this is something they're developing. We're working, other industry associations are trying to influence this, to all, especially the verification and reporting, to make this the same as what IMO is doing, so we have, uh, again, commonality here. So, that's what's going on there. Okay, let me move on now. A couple of few other subjects here. First one is fuel oil quality. This is an interesting one, in my opinion, and we can't understand it. You have a convention that's in force, Annex 6, and it requires the ship to ensure that the fuel that they burn meets certain standards. The ship has to make sure they comply. If the ship doesn't comply, the ship can be detained, the owner could be penalized. There are no requirements in that annex for the fuel supplier to provide the ship with the fuel that's required. And this is something Intertanker has felt has been wrong for a long time. We've been actively pushing this for more than five years. And each time we try it, it's been rejected. We didn't give up. And back in 2014, they finally agreed, okay, let's look into this matter. So what they did was they asked a working group or a correspondence group to develop guidelines to use, use look at this. And also asked the, the correspondence group to see if Annex 6, the legality of what was in there was, was adequate. Um, the correspondence group reported back to MEPC 68, and they said the way to go with the guidelines is to give a range or a menu of options that the fuel supplier can choose from and what they wanted to do. Side story. The U.S. EPA, or I should say the U.S. Coast Guard, led this correspondence group, and they were heavily influenced by the U.S. EPA. The U.S. EPA did not want IMO to do anything in this area. Well, at that meeting... I personally spoke saying we're extremely disappointed with this outcome. We do not think this is the right direction to go in, and we recommend there should be a best practice guidance in going forward. To my surprise, a number of member states then spoke up in favor of what we said, and so they said, okay, let's test this correspondence group to, to go back to the beginning and develop specific guidance, and to do it for three areas, the fuel provider, the purchaser, you, and also for the member states and the coastal states. Now, it's not mandatory, but at least it's a step in the right direction. It's guidance. Unfortunately, they also decided, though, that the uh, legality, if that's there, yeah, they were the view that the um, legality was not necessary, was adequate, so they didn't need to change that. All these guidelines are being developed. They will not come to this meeting in October. They will come to the meeting next year in May, and they will have at least a step in the right direction on uh, what we're trying to do on fuel oil quality, sort of protect you in this area. Any questions on this one? Okay, let's move on to the other issue. And that is fuel oil availability. As I'm sure most of you know, Annex 6 requires globally a sulfur cap of 0.5% in 2020. But when Annex 6 was written though, it does say that IMO should complete a review by the end of 2018 to determine if that fuel was available for 2020. And if it was not available, well, there'd be a group of experts. If it was not available, then, order, then the decision would then defer, not the decision, the requirement would defer to 2025. What IMO has done is form this group of experts and they contracted out a study to have an assessment done to find out if, in fact, it's believed that the fuel will be available for the shipping industry by 2020. The conclusions of that study, it's a very comprehensive study, but the conclusions of that study, I put there in quotes, that the refinery sector can produce sufficient amounts of maritime fuels to meet the demand by 2020. So this is what's being presented by the IMO study. Interestingly enough, 
two industry associations, BIPCO and IPICA, which represents the oil refinery companies, who were on the steering group for the IMO study, contracted their own study through another contractor to do an assessment. And as expected, that study has come back. And that study says that they conclude that a switch to 0.5% on January 20 does not look workable. So now the member states of IMO have a study contracted by IMO, an independent study giving conflicting results. What does that mean, in my opinion? That means any decision made by IMO on this issue is going to be a political decision. Now, by political, what I mean is this. In order for it to occur, it requires a majority, a simple majority of 50% of the party standing six to agree to one or the other. There's 87 parties. Whether all 87 show up next, next month remains, but 44 would have to go along with this. Keep in mind, 28 are parties to the convention are European Union members. So in my opinion, there's at least 28 countries that are going to say the fuel is ready in 2020. It remains to see whether they'll have uh, sufficient. But it's going to be a political decision in dealing with this. I would also add to you, at the roundtable chairman's meeting we just had this morning, we talked about this. Obviously, as you might expect, BIMCO was pushing very hard for the industry to speak with one voice to say we should go to 2025. And I would be remiss if I didn't say to you, although Intertanker doesn't have an official position, many of our members would be sympathetic to this. But what both Intertanker and ICS and perhaps with the cargo are concerned about is the credibility we have with BIMCO being on a study group that IMO sanctioned and then turning around not liking the results and giving, coming up with their own study. So this is something we're going to be talking about this week at our technical committee as well as the other associations to decide what position we want to take when we go to IMO. Should we as a shipping industry engage or should we just leave this as a political issue for the member states? We'll see what happens in October. I do anticipate though the one thing the shipping industry would like collectively is certainty. We would not like this prolonged. We would like to know definitively what date is this going to happen. Is it 2020 or 2025? Let us know so we can then plan for it. And we'll see what happens. Questions on this? Yes? Another question for the plumber. Sure. The interesting, the interesting thing about this is that the data for both studies is the same. Exactly. Yeah. So the crucial difference, I think, is that uh, the IMO study, they made one assumption which was not agreed by yep. the other study. That assumption is that the switch can be done overnight from 2019 to 2020. This is what the IMO study assumes, whereas the other study says, well, I mean, a few years for this switch cannot be done overnight. And that's the crucial difference. So. It is a political decision, but if you look at it scientifically, there's also some ground to say or to judge whose assumption is better. Uh, so I, I would Are you trying to convince me? No, I, I'm <laughs> just trying to give some more information on, on what's, a, what's a, an issue here. Yeah. Um, that, that's a very valid comment. I agree entirely with what you said. Okay. But I still think it's going to be a political decision. <laughs> OK? <laughs> OK, let's move on. Let's get out of some of these uh, environmental issues. I want to talk about cyber risk management. Um, first thing I would mention, I hope you're all aware of this, uh, the industry roundtable into Tanko, into Cargo, BIMCO, and ICS, wanting to be proactive, felt we should do something before IMO steps in or before some other national government, i.e. the US Coast Guard, should impose some requirements. So we developed industry guidelines on cyber risk management. We called it cybersecurity. These guidelines we issued in January of this year. They're available on our website or any of the other associations' websites that you could have. What I have here are the basic principles that are in the guidelines that we've put out there. And we would strongly recommend that if you're not looking at cyber risk management on your ship, you should be. And you should start, I think, at least I recommend, you start with using this as a basis upon which you, you would, would develop it. 
Now, as we suspected though, IMO, proposals were submitted to IMO to look into this matter. Uh, it was discussed in general at the end of last year at the Maritime Safety Committee that cyber uh, security is important and they solicited submissions to come to the meeting that took place in May of this year. There were submissions by the industry. We provided our guidelines. There were multiple submissions by a number of member states. China, European Union, and then France submitted their own, <laughs> in addition with the European Union, and then the U.S. They had a working group, and it moved very quickly. And what came out of this meeting in December, I'm sorry, in May, was actual interim guidelines. So the IMO Maritime Safety Committee has now issued interim guidelines for the shipping industry, well, for everybody to use in this. The basic principles of these interim guidelines are the following. I may just, just identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Basic principles. Um, this is uh, what I would call a, sort of an umbrella set of guidelines. Not detailed, but an umbrella set of guidelines. And then within those guidelines, of course, they saw what we did. They, used, they took the industry guidelines and they referenced them as an example on how you could meet the IMO guidelines with more details that the industry provides. And there's other examples that are out there too. So I'm not saying the industry guidelines are the only one. But it certainly would behoove you on your ships to make sure you've done something in this area. Um, within the U.S., uh, before I get to a few other comments here, uh, we've talked to the Admiral about this, and he has indicated, he was a little, that, that second bullet there, this Admiral, very, very smart guy, he didn't want to have these guidelines approved in May. He wanted to wait a little bit. He wanted to wait till this meeting uh, that's going to be coming up in November. We're not quite sure why, because we thought it would be in the best interest to get something out. But he finally accepted it and moved along with the principle, and that's why there was some discussion about whether they should be interim. But the principle is, well, they move forward as interim, and anybody that wishes to should submit additional comments to this upcoming meeting uh, coming up in November. Um, I checked the IMO website as of today. There's only one submission on these guidelines, and that's by the Islamic Republic of Iran. And what the Islamic Republic of Iran is <coughs> suggesting is that this is an important issue, and maybe the MEP, the MSC, should consider making these guidelines mandatory. Well, we'll see where that goes. But the concept was let's get them out as guidelines and get them working first. I would just simply add one other comment: the deadline for submission of documents was Friday. So there may be other submissions, but they have not been posted yet. So there may be more comments that could result in an improvement to these guidelines. Remains to be seen on that one. But start working with the guidelines now as a minimum would be my advice. Comments on this? OK. Am I doing OK on time? Yeah, OK. E-navigation. I throw this in now. So we understand. I went to the United States Merchant Marine Academy, graduated and got my license, sailed on tankers in the engine room. I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to what's going on in the bridge. So keep that in mind. So don't ask me any questions. I'm just trying to give you information on this one, okay? The, the first question everybody asks, Joe, what the hell is e-navigation, okay? Well, this is the one of the technical definitions that have been given at IMO, okay, up on the top, and it involves integration. In my simplistic way, I put it very simple, it's allowing information to change, exchange between the, the ship and the shore so that we can improve safe navigation. That's a good principle. I can't argue with that. Problem is, uh, there have been certain people, let me see what I get to here. Okay. And what we want to focus on, from Intertanko's standpoint, and I think all the other shipping associations, we want to focus on it, is we want to make sure the ship is provided with all the information it needs to be able to navigate safely. There are some entities, not going to mention names, up in Northern Europe, that have this thought that they want the shore side to have control of where the ship goes. And they tell the ship it should go here. And that's not the way ships should be navigated. The master should always maintain, we feel, should always maintain control of the ship. 
I think that principle has now been accepted at IMO, so I don't think we have to fight that battle anymore. But I just make you aware that's, that's still been raised. And so what IMO has done is IMO has agreed that they were going to proceed on six issues in related to e-navigation, and they've asked the subcommittee and CSR to develop these six issues. Now, I'm going to tell you what the six issues are, but I'm not sure what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> now, the first three, they're going to talk about... Uh, Guidelines for standardized modes of operation of uh, all navigation equipment. I hope you know what that means. <laughs> Development of modules to the revised performance status for integration navigation systems. Revise the guidelines and criteria for ship reporting systems. Revision of the general requirements for shipboard radio equipment, forming part of the GMDSS. Guidelines for the harmonized display of navigation information received via communications equipment, and guidelines for the definition of the format and structure for marine service portfolios. Now, I mention this, and the reason I put this on, on the in the presentation is this could result in equipment changes or need for additional equipment. So I want to make you aware this is being developed, it's ongoing at IMO, and if this is something that's of interest to you, you know, work through your associations or through your national administration on how you may want to impact this. But I feel like my job, I'm trying to let you know what's coming out there. This is something that's there. I would say on this one, like I have said in all the others, are there any questions? But I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to be able to answer any questions. Seriously, anybody? I challenge you. <laughs> okay, finally, just the last little bit of information. The point of this last one is just to let you know what your shipping industry associations are trying to do for you. Within IMO, at the Maritime Safety Committee and the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, they always have an agenda item on work program items. And this allows administrations to submit to these two committees proposals for new requirements for shipping. And They've developed guidelines, and the guidelines require that whoever submits this, inf this request must justify it with cost data and uh, you know, justify need for it and all sorts of other things. Each meeting that I go to, there are at least 10 pr new proposals on the table, both at the MSC, more, more, more on the safety side than the environment side, but there's at least 10 proposals where a member state is looking to have more done in the area of safety or environmental protection. And the IMO committee then follows these guidelines a little bit. For the most part, in my opinion, sometimes the guidelines are just ignored. And if everybody says yes, it goes through. So what we did as a solid group of industries, associations, we went to the IMO council and we said, we don't believe that these guidelines are robust enough. And we want these guidelines to be changed, to be provide any submission for a new work program item that's going to impose a requirement on the industry to provide substantive evidence of a compelling need and provide uh, the economic benefits of this. It was discussed at the council meeting back in, let's see if I get this right, uh, in 2015. They said, good subject, let's defer it till our next meeting. That was in July of 2016. At July of 2016, a lot of comments being made by member states. The chairman said, keep in mind at that meeting they were electing a new secretary general also. So the time was kind of limited. So they said, let's discuss it again. So they're going to discuss it again in November. So it's, it's not you know, going exactly the way we'd like it, but it's progressing. And we'll see how we'll continue to, to look out for your interest in this. With that, Unless there are any questions on that, I would simply a little propaganda. I'm allowed to do that, right? Intertanko is having our annual tanker event in the United States next year. It's going to be at the Houstonian Hotel in Houston, Texas. Those are the dates. We're going to have uh, the usual events there. The tanker summit will be the highlight. What we're looking for at the tanker summit is two sessions. The first session with a number of the oil major senior representatives coming, talking to our members about what they want them to deliver when they carry their cargo. And I already have commitment from two senior people from oil majors to be coming and speaking on that panel. And the afternoon session, 
what we're thinking about right now is focusing on more poll enforcement. We're still seeing the U.S. Department of Justice prosecuting ship owners, sometimes not tanker owners, for these magic pipes and things like that, and now they're handling that. So we want to put a panel on there with the ship owners, the Department of Justice, the U.S. Coast Guard, and let's get this all talked out and see what people think about this. So maybe that's a little enticement for someone that may want to come. With that, I say thank you. I apologize if I took too long. I'll try to give you a complete picture. Okay? Thank you.